Hello and welcome to Fantastic History. I'm Clay. I'm Sarah. We're a husband and wife duo who enjoy telling each other about amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history. Now, Sarah. Yes? As you may be aware, the year is 2022. Oh, for real? Yeah. And there is war in Russia. Yeah, I have heard that, yeah. But well, it's in the Ukraine mostly, but sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to take us back to a simpler time, real quick. <laughs> the year is 1904. Oh, <laughs> and war is brewing in Russia. Okay, again. Yeah. Mm. Well, but this time it's with Japan. Oh. You see, in 1904, Japan had recently emerged out of centuries of isolation. And had quickly become the strongest military power in East Asia after defeating China in the Sino-Japanese War ending in 1895. Whoa. But at the time, at the same time, Russia was also flexing its might in the East. It was meddling in China, Manchuria, and Korea. It had a strategic naval base in Manchuria, Port Arthur, which had once belonged to Japan. And it's located in the Yellow Sea. Okay. And tensions were rising against these two major powers as they vied for more power and control over over the the area. Now, Britain had made a treaty with Japan. Korea and China were choosing to remain neutral despite impending war uh, right on their doorsteps. Yeah, no kidding. So Japan began building up its military and the Imperial Japanese Navy on the night of um, February 8th, 1904, And this new navy launched a surprise attack on the Russian ships at Port Arthur. Russia was shocked, not only that Japan had attacked, as they believed if war were to start, that they would be the ones to start it. (laughs) But also they had been attacked without a formal declaration of war. The surprise attack was devastating and allowed the opportunity for the uh, Japanese to create a blockade around Port Arthur and uh, cause the destruction of many of Russia's naval forces in the east. Uh, because they had not been preparing for yeah. engagement yet. <laughs> and being such a large country, most most of their naval fleet was not even stationed in the east at this point. <laughs> and now Japan had naval superiority and safe passage of their supplies and troops to you know the mainland. Oh yeah. So Russia needed to So Russia needed to get the rest of their navy there. Tsar Nicholas II was convinced that Russia would be victorious as long as they were able to win key naval battles, so having their full naval might there was of utmost importance. So, the Tsar called upon the Baltic Naval Fleet to make haste to reinforce their ships in the Yellow Sea. Now, at this point, just just a note, he changed the name of the Baltic Naval Fleet to the 2nd Pacific Squadron, because it was headed to the Pacific. Okay. But for ease of, just just to keep things a little bit easier to, to, to follow here, I'm going to continue to refer to them as the Baltic Fleet. Okay. Because we're going to be dealing with other Pacific fleets. It's just easier to keep track of everything. Gotcha. Now, there's a huge problem with this, Sarah. Is there? Well, the Baltic Fleet was, I don't know if you know this, they were in the Baltic. That makes sense, yeah. And to reach the east... Well, they couldn't just sail north through the Arctic. There was a lot of ice. <laughs> yeah, Arctic is known for that. So they were going to have to sail south. Now, as you may recall, Britain had a treaty with Japan, but was not hostile towards Russia. However, not wanting to provide advantages, they refused Russian access to the Suez Canal for their battleships. Oh. So this meant that the Baltic fleet would have to sail all the way down to the tip of Africa. And across the Indian Ocean. Oh my God! An eight, an eighteen thousand mile, seven month journey, <gasps> in which they would have no refuel ports in Africa or Asia, and they were sailed by a very inexperienced crew of mostly farmers who saw very little naval action, as their port was often frozen. This is the most insane thing I've ever heard. <laughs> like, what is the point? Well, as you recall. They weren't expecting engagement, so they were sort of caught with their pants down <laughs> and said, well, we got we to gotta, we gotta throw something together. But seven months, like, it's going to be over by then, guys. Well, they were hoping that they could hold them off. Oh, man. And, and the Japanese were hoping that this engagement, they would be able to take Port Arthur 
and um, win strategic um, land. And by the by the time that um, like naval reinforcements had come and they weren't too far into Russia because they weren't going to be able to take they weren't able to be able to be take over Russia. Mm-hmm. There's no way they were going to do that. But their their ultimate goal was to um, get as far as they could before the United States intervened and oh. and arranged a peace treaty because mm-hmm. that's real that was really their goal. Oh, okay. Was to you know launch an attack, have um, have superiority, have have success, and then and then deal with a peace treaty where they could get some advantages. Okay. They were not trying to like obliterate Russia because so Russia the, is very big, as I said. The whole goal of all of this was to get the treaty. Yeah. Okay. To get okay. the treaty. Add on top of that the fact that this coal-powered fleet was not designed for such long voyages. <laughs> this harrowing trip was going to be a spectacle of Russian resilience and determination throughout the world. Uh It's going to be a show of like, you know, superiority. Oh, yeah. European superiority at that. So going for, there are going to be some Russian names that I'm probably going to mispronounce, but I'm going to try my best, okay? Okay. So Admiral Roshavinsky was to lead the Baltic fleet, a man with a trigger temper who earned the nickname Mad Dog because (laughs) at the ease at which he would lash out. (laughs) And he also had a tendency of throwing his binoculars in rage. So the flagship had to carry a large supply of extra <laughs> binoculars on hand. <laughs> okay. But he was a good leader to deal with this difficult mission and keep everyone in line. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. strike some fear into them. Sure. The fleet was a mixture of new and old battleships, as well as more outdated cruisers, destroyers, and a supporting fleet of ships. Which uh, came to a total of 45 vessels that were going to go out on this very long trip. Oh, boy. After preparing the ships, sailors, and supplies, the hodgepodge fleet set sail on October 16th, 1904, along with a few German coaling ships to you know provide them with the coal. However, b- problems began almost immediately. <laughs> oh, boy. While leaving port, one ship lost its anchor and two <gasps> other ships collided with oh each other. Oh, my God. The collision put one ship out of commission. (laughs) So the fleet left base already one short. Oh my God. Now the sailors were quite stressed and nervous because rumors were spreading that the Japanese had sent torpedo boats to the Baltic. Oh. Very destructive. Yeah. And And they had come to the Baltic to sabotage the fleet. So the crew was on constant watch for any vessel that came into view. Now, the likelihood of a Japan, of the Japanese actually reaching the Baltic in that amount of time and finding them, very unlikely. Mm-hmm. But, you know, war breeds paranoia. Well, and they surprised you guys before. Maybe they were already planning this knowing they'd send, you know, the Baltic fleet. That's what they, that's probably what they were thinking. Oh, yeah. And it was this paranoia that leads us to the Dogger Bank incident. Oh. On the night of October 14th, Rostovinsky's fleet approached a British fishing fleet operating out of Hull and fishing on the Dogger Bank, which is about 60 miles off the coast of England in the North Sea. At this time, fleets of ships worked together, supporting one another between fishing, holding the catch, and carrying supplies for the fishermen like food and water. So when the Baltic fleet saw dozens of ships in the distance, Oh no. Their first thought was those... Those must be the Japanese torpedo boats we've been hearing so much about oh, no. from one another. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, the fishermen did try to signal that they were merely fishing trawlers, but the fleet mistook their signals as some sort of Japanese weaponry. Oh, my God. And they opened fire. <gasps> the trawlers had their nets down, so they were unable to quickly flee. The trawler Crane was hit, killing two crew members while the rest of them were actually rescued by other ships. The Minnow and the uh, Molmen were also hit, injuring more fishermen as they tried to flee. So they were just getting bombarded. My God. And trying to escape. Yeah. Injuries upon injuries and and ships being uh, damaged. But then the Russians' attention turned the opposite direction. More vessels were approaching them from this side. Oh. A surprise attack. The attacking warships turned their attention to these vessels that were coming from the other side and began firing on them. 
This managed to give the British trawlers time to escape as the Russians exchanged fire with these new enemies. Thank God. Ships reported seeing torpedoes shooting past them in the water. <gasps> while um, on another ship, they were they believed they were being boarded, so crew uh, prepared for hand-to-hand combat oh my with, with swords Ooh. against the Japanese aggressors. All the while, these warships were firing at each other in the black of night. Oh, no. And the chaos... It lasted about Ugh. 25 minutes. For God's sake. Before finally one of the Russian vessels displayed a blue light, and this meant to cease firing. Mm-hmm. When the smoke finally cleared, uh, the details of the battle had become clear. The enemy ships that had been flanking the battleships from the rear, they were not Japanese, Sarah. Uh-huh. They were, were they Russian? They were Russian. Yeah. Wow, guys. The Baltic oh, fleet had mistook their own ships God. as the enemy. <laughs> oh, <my God. coughs> oh, boy. Mm. <laughs> That's embarrassing. So the Baltic fleet had, uh, had, had mistaken their cruisers, the Aurora and the Dmitry Donovsky, uh, and seven of their battleships just bombarded these tiny cruisers. Oh, my God. Damaging both and killing two, <gasps> including a chaplain. Oh, no. Now, surprisingly, these seven battleships, and they, these were these included the newest and most modern of the Russian fleet, right? These new iron mm. battles, like modern battleships. Oh, yeah. They were not able to completely obliterate... The two cruisers. Oh. Well, that just goes to show the quality of the sailors manning the guns. In fact, the battleship Oreo fired 500 shells and missed every single shot. Oh, my God. They're stormtroopers. No ship was damaged so badly that it had to be turned back either. Wow. This also basically included the... British fi- fishing vessels as well, despite oh, no. taking the entire might of the Russian Navy. They only lost one ship. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> so when this all came to, when they when they realized what had happened, one, that there were no Japanese, they were firing on their own ship. Oh and two, that they were firing on um, British fishing trawlers. Uh-huh. The Russians just left. Yeah. Without trying to help anyone. That sounds right. All in all, two fishermen died. Six were injured and one ship sank and five boats were damaged. But it's interesting that the fatalities on both sides were equal. Uh-huh. So the, the British had a tie. <sighs> the fishermen had a tie with the uh, the uh, Russian Navy. Right. Yep. So. Oh, my God. The Dogger Bank incident was a massive diplomatic shitstorm. <laughs> Britain even prepared war. <gasps> And as we discussed in the Horace van der Kolle episode, the Royal Navy was, at the time, the best in the world. Oh, yeah. It was first class, and Russia realized how royally they had messed up because the Royal Navy would obliterate Well, and plus they were great friends with uh, representatives from Zanzibar, so now you have to worry (laughs) about them, too. Yeah, Zanzibar. (laughs) Uh, So... Uh, Russia agreed to investigate the incident. British cruisers actually shadowed the Baltic fleet as, as it made its way down to Spain, where they docked, and Roshevinsky handed over officers that he decided were responsible for the event. Oh, okay. Yeah. Miraculously, war with Britain was avoided, avoided in thanks both to Russia's quickness to apologize. So they didn't want that mess. <laughs> um, not to antagonize the, the Royal Navy or anything. Uh-huh. <clears throat> And also the fact that Tsar Nicholas II's cousin happened to be King George V. Ah, yeah, that'll help. Yeah, that'll, that'll help. Russia ended up paying um, the equivalent of $5.8 million in today's money as Oof. compensation for the event, too. Oof. So, Dogger Bank incident um, is, is merely a footnote. A big footnote, but it is a footnote in this story because we are going to continue on. Oh, my God. They kept going. With the British cruisers finally leaving them and them having recalled in Spain, their (laughs) worldwide spectacular journey was immediately tarnished. Mm -hmm. But they had a job to do. The Baltic fleet trudged on from Vigo, Spain to Tangiers, Morocco, where the ship's anchor severed the city's underwater telegraph cable, leaving Africa cut off from Europe for four days. 
and as they made their way into the long trip across the African coast, their decks were packed with coal as they hoarded as much as they possibly could because they didn't have any reliable refueling oh, in yeah. Africa. This created respiratory issues for the sailors who could not find clean air above or below deck. Oh my god. All the while they sweltered in the tropical heat that they were unaccustomed to. Oh my god. So morale was low. Yeah, I imagine. They've Cab- all got the black lung. <laughs> Cabin fever was setting in and the crew was in desperate need of some time off the ship to decompress because it's been months already and oh, months to go. Boy. Um, they were able to find an opportunity when the fleet made port in Madagascar. Oh, it seemed to be just what the crew needed as they eagerly took in the exotic tropical scenes and most importantly, the animals. Yeah. Sailors purchased and brought animals back onto the ship as souvenirs and mascots. Oh God. Parrots, chameleons, one crocodile. Oh, okay. And very many venomous snakes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> God. Many of these animals escaped on the ship and multiplied quickly. Uh-huh. Oh, my God. But it wasn't just the animals that the sailors brought on board from Madagascar. They also became infected with <gasps> tropical diseases. Oh, dear. And STDs. Uh-huh. But as bad as this was, news would reach Ravicheski on January 7th. While they were in Madagascar, they would be far worse than anything that has happened yet. Oh, boy. Maybe not the Dogger Bank incident. That was well, really bad. Yeah. But Russia had lost control of Port Arthur. <gasps> Uh-oh. In the ensuing months, Japan had been trying to take the port. Mm-hmm. They had taken, you know, this. The, the, they had sea superiority, but they hadn't taken the port itself because Russians had put up such a strong resistance. The port which the uh, Baltic fleet had been summoned to protect was now lost. And the fate of the first Pacific Squadron was in peril. They were, all, they were already beaten down really ha- really hard, and now it's looking worse. With the surrender of Port Arthur, the Baltic fleet would now have to reach the port of Vladivostok, which was in Russia and just north of Korea in the Sea of Japan. Oh, dear. Yes. Mm. But this would be very dangerous because it would take them right through the Tsushima Strait between Korea and Japan. Yeah, that doesn't sound ideal. They could also take another route around, but that would lose precious time. But <sighs> so, very, uh, very important situation is happening now. The Russian Naval Command decided to form a third Pacific Squadron made up of the most obsolete clunker <laughs> ships that they had. <laughs> the ones that Ravachesky had rejected while amassing his fleet Mm -hmm. this infuriated the admiral not because he saw it as a useless endeavor but also because it was going to delay his trip as they uh as they made rendezvous with the new squadron approaching Mm. from the black sea now unfortunately for them they were small enough and in good enough graces to be allowed access through the suez canal so it wasn't going to take them okay an additional like five months to go around the tip of africa and they managed not to cut any underwater cables along the way. Oh. So there's that. By February 1905, morale had hit an all-time low, and mutiny was brewing among the most discontent sailors. Fortunately, Ravicheski was able to stomp an insubordination, uh, sending leaders and others accused of insurrection back to Russia, along with the sick and any others that he wanted to get off the ship. Get like a bunch of the venomous snakes, maybe. Maybe. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't know how they, how they would have found them. <laughs> By March, the 3rd Squadron was still making its way through the Mediterranean, and the Baltic fleet was speeding across the Indian Ocean towards Singapore. Now, during their voyage across open oceans, Robicheski prepared training exercises and target practice because they had to they had to train. Um, but the results were less than favorable. <laughs> Shocked. Ships did not follow orders. Torpedoes malfunctioned and gunners were unable to hit the targets. Uh, but they were able to actually hit the uh, the ships towing the targets. Oh, my God. <laughs> so at least there was that. <laughs> well, the two fleets combined, um, although Robicheski thought that their addition made no difference. And finally, in May 1905, the tired fleet approached the Tsushima Strait. 
Okay. Sailing outside of regular shipping channels to avoid detection, they entered on the night of the 27th, which was very foggy, which was advantageous for them because they were Mm. trying to be sneaky. Sure. Um, All ship lights were extinguished except the hospital ship, um, the Oral, as this was in compliance with the rules of law. You kept your hospital ship visible. It is what it is. Yeah. It was on their first night in the strait that the Oral noticed a ship approaching them. Now, knowing what happened in Dogger Bay, I'm sure you're thinking immediately that immediately they declared that it was a Japanese torpedo boat and sent words to all the war- nearby warships to just obliterate it or at least warn them and, and chaos was going to ensue. But the Oral did not. They were careful because this had been, you know, oh yeah, a huge mess. And they identified it as one of their fellow Russian ships <laughs> um, and probably wishing that what they had done in Dogger Bay. Well, it was not a Russian ship. That was going to be my guess. Yeah. I figure whatever they end up doing is going to be the wrong thing. To do. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was not a Russian ship, nor was it a civilian fishing trawler. No, this time it was actually the Japanese Navy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the Japanese Navy. But luckily, the Oral did not do anything too foolish, such as mm, signal to the enemy ship the entire Russian fleet was there. Uh, actually, sorry, I misread that. That's exactly what they did. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. Captain Narukawa of the Shinao Maru sent a wireless telegraph message to Admiral Togo, the location of the enemy. And at 1,400 hours, the Russians saw emerge from the fog the full might of the Imperial Navy waiting for them. Oh, my God. And this was bad. Yeah. Not just for that reason, but because um, they had crossed the Russian T. So the Russians are approaching in a straight line. And as they, as they, as they, uh, as they come out of the fog, they see all these ships... Um, sideways oh. with their with their mighty oh. uh, side cannons and turrets oh no prepared to fire whereas the russians could only engage with their forward turrets which were not yeah very powerful so they had to make a choice were they going to fight full speed ahead retreat surrender what were they going to do trying to think what's the worst thing to do because that'll be what i mean do. it's almost there's, almost every choice is bad yeah right? there's not there's not a good option for sure throw the snakes at them just <laughs> fill the cannons full of snakes and start shooting those over well vastly outnumbered and outmatched by the more modern japanese fleet russia and japan engaged in the very first and last decisive sea battle fought by modern steel battleship fleets interesting yeah the russian fleet was annihilated yeah when the battle was over 5045 russian sailors were dead over 6000 were captured six of their battleships sunk and the other two captured more ships were sunk and captured as well comparatively the japanese only lost three torpedo boats oh and 117 sailors oh Okay. Rovacheski was among those captured. Not only was the decisive defeat devastating militarily, but also for the public opinion in Russia. Yeah. Uh-huh. Only three ships ended ended up making it to their destination, but this made no difference. Right. The war had just been lost. Yeah. On September 5th, Russia and Japan signed a peace treaty with um, U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt as mediator, and he won a Nobel Peace Prize for mediating <laughs> this peace. <laughs> That's good for him. This whole thing is a farce. That's incredible. <laughs> and uh, Robicheski, when he returned to Russia, was sentenced to death. Oh, for his oh be- for for you know what happened. Um, I don't believe he actually was executed. I think there was a pardon or something. That oh. Happened. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> oh. it was, it was bad. Yeah. It was also the first time in, uh, in history that, uh, maybe modern history 
but um, that a Eastern power had defeated a Western power. Interesting. In such a mighty battle. Yeah. War. Dang. So that is the story of the catastrophic journey of the 1905 Russian Baltic fleet. My God. Pretty crazy, huh? Pretty crazy. I, I'm i just speechless over how, I mean, how many things need to go wrong before you think to yourself, you know, maybe this is not the move. <laughs> maybe we're not meant to go. I mean, every single thing is telling us to turn back and we are not equipped for this. Yeah. Oof. It was a it was a mess, and it ended up not making a lick of difference. Right, but oof, but they made it. I mean, yeah. you got to give it to them. They yeah. they they made that long trip. Yeah, okay. <laughs> give it to them, I guess. Give, give them something. Well, hey, thanks for listening, Sarah. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. And all of you out there, if you like today's episode, please take a second to rate, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. A rating is a very beautiful thing. <laughs> it helps us out a lot. Um, so if you can rate and and feel, please do. It's very helpful to us. We're also on Twitter and Instagram where we share pictures from this from our episodes as well as other fun content. We are fantastic H Pod on both. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future topics, please email us at fantastichistorypod at gmail.com. And we will see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.